Welcome to Voices of the Community, which explores critical issues facing Northern California communities. We introduce you to the voices of community thought leaders and change makers who are working on solutions that face our fellow individual community members, neighborhoods, cities, and our region. This is George Coster, your host. This episode is part of our series exploring COVID-19's impact on nonprofits and small businesses in the San Francisco Bay Area. Back in April of 2020, when we decided to create this ongoing series on COVID-19's impact, first on nonprofits and then on small businesses in the San Francisco Bay Area, we, like you, had no idea how long the pandemic would go on and what the health and economic impact would be in our community. As we enter our second year of the global COVID-19 pandemic, with record numbers of both cases and deaths, our schools, businesses, and governments are still struggling to deal with the health, economic, mental, and societal impacts of the latest Omicron variant. This all adds to the ongoing uncertainty of our ever-changing indoor and outdoor vaccinated and unvaccinated protocols and the politics of the pandemic that will drive how we all come back together as a unified or fractured community. We will continue to shine a spotlight on the nonprofits and small businesses that make up the fabric of our community, along with the founders and staff who are struggling to deal with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on their operations, services, and sustainability until we can all get to the other side of the pandemic. Along the way, we will also share with you all the amazing solutions that our nonprofits, small businesses, foundations, and government leaders are working on to help us all get to the other side of the pandemic and come together to rebuild our communities with more economic, social, and environmental equality. So I think that there is a belief that food banks are serving shelterless individuals, that we're serving extremely poor people. And the reality is that here in Sonoma County, the last official count that they did, there were approximately 2,900 shelterless individuals, but we're reaching about 100,000 people. So that delta, the difference between the two is everybody else. So whoever people are imagining is hungry, it just turns out that it's just an awful lot of people and nobody stands around the water cooler at work and says, I'm food insecure or I'm hungry we're not making it, we're struggling. Rather, they pursue their food assistance in silence. And our job is just to make sure that they are comforted when they come. Over the past two years of producing the special series on COVID-19's impact on nonprofits in our community, we've brought you stories about nonprofits working on some of our long-term social issues, such as homelessness, housing, hygiene, and mental health. In this one-hour special show, we wanted to turn our focus back to food insecurity for children, families, and seniors. Since the COVID-19 pandemic breakout in March of 2020, food insecurity has increased dramatically. According to Feeding America and the state of California, the overall food insecurity rate for 2021 was projected to be 12%, which is 484,000 people who are food insecure on any given day. CalFresh is the California version of the old federal food stamp program, and their numbers show that CalFresh recipients in San Francisco increased by 42% from November 2019 to November 2021. This episode is focused on the work of the Redwood Empire Food Bank, who provides one of the most basic needs, food, along with wraparound services to our North Bay community members. I'm joined remotely by hunger relief worker and CEO David Goodman, Director of Programs, Allison Goodwin, along with Food Bank Services recipient, Sam Cagle, and volunteer, as well as Program Coordinator, Juana Renovato. Welcome to Voices of the Community, Juana, Sam, Allison, and David. I'm going to begin with you, David, if you could provide our audience uh, an overview of Redwood Empire Food Bank's history and your mission. I think part of that would be who the food bank serves, because I think in a lot of people who are listening to the show or people's idea of who goes to a food bank specifically is completely different, especially now with the pandemic. Sure. The Redwood Empire Food Bank is the largest hunger relief organization north of the Golden Gate Bridge all the way up to the Oregon border. And we're currently reaching about 100,000 people throughout the year. Some people come every day. Some people come for help once a week. Some people come once in a month. Some people come once in a lifetime. 
And we're currently distributing approximately $59 million worth of groceries to people that are in need of food assistance. And could you talk a little bit about the safety net? I was watching one of your presentations and you talked about the food bank becoming the safety net for the community and your concept of the safety net can't just be a net sitting on the ground, but actually has to be lifted by the community. Sure. Well, I think one of the things that we've realized, uh, the Redwood Empire Food Bank has now been exposed to numerous disasters. We've had human-made disasters, public safety power shutdowns, political disasters such as the federal shutdown, Russian river flooding, uh, numerous fires, and now a global pandemic. And what we've realized through every one of these disasters is that when people fall, that there needs to be a net there to catch them. So in essence, you need to be prepared for any disaster, any emergency, so that when people fall, they don't hit the ground because the safety net that sits on the ground doesn't do anybody any good. Through all of these disasters, we've realized that the number of people falling, we need to fortify the net continually. We need to broaden the net continually. And uh, we need to repair the net because people have fallen through it. Thank you. And turning to you, Allison, could you provide the audience an overview of your programs and the community members that you serve? Sure. So we find that we are here for anybody in need of food assistance. So like David mentioned, that could be a really a situational thing for somebody. So they might have a knee surgery and say, gosh, I'm going to be out of work temporarily. I just need some help to get by for the next six weeks. And then others might find that they say, wow, okay, now that I've tapped into this resource, I'm not sure that I can survive without it because I'm on a fixed income. And unless there's some huge windfall, this is now something I will come to rely upon. So knowing that both of those things are a part of our work and the reality for the people that we serve, we'd like to think that we're here for anybody that needs it. We do offer programming in three different initiatives. So with the idea in mind that the needs of seniors might be dramatically different than a family with young children. So we do have different catch points and times of day and basically ways that they access us. So a school environment versus a senior housing complex or a community center or a large parking lot. So just the way that we offer services, while the offering might not be dramatically different, we want everybody to have access to fresh produce and you know, milk and eggs and protein and things like that. The modality in which we offer it, the locations in which we choose, we try to make that make sense for the audience that we're trying to capture. George, if I might add to that. Sure, please do. So I think that there's a belief that food banks are serving shelterless individuals, that we're serving extremely poor people. And the reality is that here in Sonoma County, the last official count that they did, there were approximately 2,900 shelterless individuals, but we're reaching about 100,000 people. So that delta, the difference between the two is everybody else. So whoever people are imagining is hungry, it just turns out that there, it's just an awful lot of people and nobody stands around the water cooler at work and says, I'm food insecure or I'm hungry. We're not making it. We're struggling. Rather, they pursue their food assistance in silence. And our job is just to make sure that they are comforted when they come. Well, and staying with that for a moment, David, I thought one of your points about it's the American fallacy that everyone can pull themselves up by their bootstraps, et cetera. But I thought your point that who you serve is us. Yeah, well, you know, America, as great as we are, there's a significant myth that we have here, which is that if you go to school and you get a job and you work hard, everything is going to be okay. And every day we meet people who have done all the, quote, right things, unquote, and yet they still find themselves in need because need comes through all the disasters we just mentioned, but it could be getting injured on the job. It could be aging out of the employment, you know, the workforce. It could be another mouth to feed in the household, whether it's a child or a senior, a downturn in the economy, losing a job. It just, the list it goes on. I've been doing this for 27 years and I've never heard the same story twice. If I can interrupt and keep playing off of that. The reason that when we talk about social services and that safety net, the reason that hunger relief is unique perhaps to other programs that people access. So for example, subsidized housing, subsidized childcare, when somebody finds that they're in a challenging situation and they go to said resource and say, I'd like to sign up to be on the list for subsidized housing. I'd like to access subsidized childcare for my children. 
that's a list that once you are on it, and that's a resource that once you have secured it, you cannot jeopardize. You can't say, okay, so I'm actually doing all right. I'm making a couple hundred more dollars a month in rent. So I'm going to let them know and I'm going to, you know, perhaps give up my space and move somewhere else that I can afford right now. And the reason people wouldn't make that choice is because they will never get that spot back, likely. Same thing for subsidized childcare. And what makes hunger relief different and accessing food banks different is that you can bow in and bow out as needed and as your situation changes. So like David said, you might come once and say, wow, that was incredible. I'm so glad they were there the one time I needed it. And then you might say, okay, so I was here four years ago post fire and I never thought I would be here again. And now I'm here because of, you know, said global pandemic. So there really isn't jeopardy in saying, no, I'm good. And then there isn't jeopardy again to say, actually, okay, so I'm back. And really, they get welcomed with the same energy and commitment that we were there four years ago, to David's point, 27 years ago. There's no risk in them taking a break or coming as often as they need to. Thank you. And staying with you, Allison, could you share a little bit about the kind of program which has led, as I understand it, to the Daily Essentials program and the diaper bank, you know, part of it? So it sounds like you're also doing hygiene, et cetera. The W-5 program is our participation program. So the way we think about that is understanding a little bit about the clients that we serve will allow us to serve them better. So rather than the Redwood Empire Food Bank a short while ago thinking, oh gosh, we don't want any barriers to access. We don't really want to ask anybody anything because we don't want them to feel like they have to give up all of their information in order to access services. We quickly realized that if we do have something like diapers available or we get a donation of feminine hygiene products or toothbrushes for young children, the challenge was is we didn't really know exactly where that need was and where those families were. We had a guess to say, okay, let's try this location. But understanding a little bit more about the people that we serve in their unique household allows us to really streamline and target those distributions or those areas or regions that is a necessity. So what that looks like is people come the first time that they come, we welcome them, of course, and say, okay, this is how this works. You give us basic information about your household. Of course, that information is not shared, um, but this is what we're using it for. And this is how we are thinking about you as somebody that we serve, not so much that your household is being looked at, or you, the Jones family or the Smith family. It's more just about what access do you need? Would diapers be helpful to you? Would toothbrushes be helpful to you? Would feminine hygiene products be helpful? And then they register one time, they receive a card that looks like a you know grocery store club card or a library club card. And they can just scan that at each distribution that they go to. And we're actually expanding W5 through our partner network as well. So as they come for food assistance, we welcome them again, they scan that card and we can track the assistance that we're providing, which then allows us to gauge, okay, great, we had 10 families that needed diapers. Now we know exactly how many diapers to bring back to that same site later. Allison, now that you've buried the lead, what does W5 stand for? W5 is our participation program, and it stands for the who, what, where, when, why of the people that we serve. So understanding how far they're traveling, how often they're coming, where does it make the most sense? Are they coming a mile away or are they driving seven miles, not realizing that we have Um, distributions closer to home for them, who they are, what they might need, and how they came to access services from us. So can you share a little bit, Alison, about the seniors program? David mentioned it a little bit, but you know, I think the seniors have been impacted very hard by the pandemic on obviously health part of it, but just isolation, not being able to show up perhaps at a food bank, drive through. We had put a lot of effort into seniors Just prior to the pandemic, in the fourth quarter of 2019, we had expanded our services to just say, gosh, there's all these affordable housing sites for seniors and, you know, perhaps they're having a hard time with transportation or access. And so let's really consciously think about where we're offering distributions and make sure that we are in senior centers and mobile home parks and things like that. So when the pandemic hit, we went okay, wait, it's not that we have to expand necessarily, we just now have to do this more safely. So rather than seniors coming down to the community room and gathering for coffee before they picked up their groceries, we said, no, 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 
stay home and we will bring it to your doorstep. And so we really just had to mobilize to be contactless as opposed to still gathering in those locations. It was definitely tricky from a volunteer standpoint. People were concerned during the pandemic to be coming out and being with people more. So there was definitely a concern around, do we have enough willing hands that can do this sort of schlepping of all the groceries to everybody's doorstep? But once we were able to communicate that and have that happen, we've been able to maintain that really this whole time is to say it's more of a porch delivery from where we already were and didn't have to launch into entirely new programming. It doesn't address isolation entirely and that seniors really enjoyed the fact that they were coming to the community room and gathering and getting to know their neighbors before picking up groceries. So we hope that will really go back to normal for those seniors. So again, our programming is available in either way, but we would like to be able to have them enjoy one another while they also are picking up their groceries. Allison, same with you. Over this last almost two years, how has the COVID-19 pandemic really impacted the operations and perhaps expansion of the food bank's programs? Our programs are pretty well established in that they do take care of everyone. So again, thinking about our senior security initiative, our neighborhood hunger network, and also our Every Child Every Day programming, it didn't have to change who we were serving exactly, just the modality as to how. So we are at a point where we've completely maximized our space. So stay tuned for what that might look like in um, our future. But um, with refrigeration and frozen and using offsite storage and using every inch of our warehouse. So there's definitely been um, a push and a pull and putting our facility to its max capacity. But from the participant side of things, I don't think they would feel that impact. I think we've done a really tremendous job at saying, don't worry, we got you. We're just adding opportunities to pick up groceries instead of something being twice a month. um, It might be weekly now or something being once a month. It's now twice a month. So it's really just consistency for the people that we serve. So they know that we're a reliable source. So I don't think they would notice necessarily the impact as much as all of us internally saying, oh gosh, how do we do this efficiently and keep the food flowing and keep volunteers safe, but also doing the work here too, because we can't do it without them. Thank you. And coming back to you, David, how has the pandemic impacted, you know, the fundraising component support? Has it increased support? Has it been easier? Have you been able to tap into any of the government funds that have rolled out? From your perspective, how has it impacted the food bank? Well, I think the global pandemic has been a paradigm shift for food banks all across the country. And the Rebid Empire Food Bank is no different. We really made a shift, a significant shift during the time from second responders is what we called ourselves prior to the pandemic, to first responders. So for the past two years, every night when you turned on the television or you looked in the newspaper or listened to the radio, it was not a police action and it wasn't uh, firefighters. And other than hospitals, it wasn't the paramedics going to people's homes. Instead, the news coverage was about food insecurity and hunger. So with that lens, food banks all across the country have received tremendous support, which is a good thing because in short order, our services doubled. Within, I just asked my colleague yesterday, I think uh, in the first two weeks, if I'm not mistaken, in the first two weeks of March of 2020, we had a 24% increase in the amount of food we distribute in two weeks. Imagine any business anywhere increasing by 24% in two weeks. But along with the sort of support increase is the increase in empathy. Nothing happens without empathy. Empathy is the fuel for all that we do. You know, charity goes a little way, you know, and sympathy goes a little way, but it's not until people can put themselves in the shoes of others where sort of they become us and we can identify with the people that are being impacted. That's the real shift. That's the real paradigm shift. And I would like to believe, and I would like to hope that we never return to being second responders or that the empathy diminishes in any way. Thank you. And uh, I want to turn to Juana and Sam, and let's start first with Juana. Could you please share with the audience how you got engaged in the Redwood Empire Food Bank's programs? I started here like 
almost 18 years ago, I started like a volunteering, making phone calls, reminder to the seniors about the senior program. And at that time, I doing uh, some college computer classes and they have a program like contract, like for start my career, like working here. So after when I done with my contract, the three months, I think I believe it's three months, and they offered me the position I love to be working here. I shared with my supervisor that time, do you give me an opportunity to be part of the food bank? And she's like, of course. So 18 years, I'm still here. Wow. And could you share with us perhaps one of your favorite stories of working at the food bank? I had so many years, <laughs> so many stories. But one of the best things is like before I start working here, I receiving food and being a recipient. So I feel like in the past, I'm on the other side of the table. Now I am the other side. And for my experience, probably I'm going to jump a little bit. But for my experience, when I have my kid little is my little one is like six year old. And I had three kids that time. My husband make $250 for a week. And I barely, I'm not working that time, barely working. And there's not enough money to pay bills. And at those times, I don't have insurance. I don't have anything. So what we do, we go into one of the pantries to get a groceries from the food bank. And I don't know anything that time about the food bank, but I go into those pantries. And I have to go that time, like at 5 o'clock in the morning, very early, get my baby kid and the asking for right because I don't drive those years. So in coming to that place and get the groceries, when I come in home and open those boxes for groceries, my kids get so excited to get those like a treat. It's a treat for them because I'm not be able to buy food for them. So that's why when I came back like employee here, I have to treat the community the same way to I like to be treated. Well, and staying with you, Juana, what do you feel has been the biggest impact of the food bank, obviously on your life and your family and your experience, but on the community's experience itself, other families that you've seen over the years? Yeah, it's big impact, especially right now. Like what I noticed week by week is I see those faces. I see the people share with me how hard it's been. Like sometimes they have to decide to get it groceries to pay bills and it's hard for them and it's hard for me to see the community, the need, and the coming and sharing. Like if they go to one of the distribution and we don't have enough food to serve, like I ordered for, like example, yesterday I ordered for 200 families and we have like 220. But the lucky thing is we have many places where they can go. And I feel sad for the ones that come all the way here to this location to get the food. And I said, oh, you can go to another location. And thanks W5 because they're hoping to communicate it with the community too. Because it's not like embarrassed to ask in call, say, hey, I need food. How you can help me? But now they have the ability to get the W5 and they can go to the website and find the locations when they can get assistance. So it's easy for me and hear the stories and share with them. We hear for you guys and we hear you guys situations and we try to do the best we can. Thank you. And coming to you, Sam, how did you get engaged with the food bank? Well, initially I came to the food bank back with the 2008 recession. I had just come out of an interim position in San Francisco, and uh, there were just no jobs. I, I couldn't find a job. So there was a couple of years there that I was coming to the food bank in and out. And then more recently, um, I, like a lot of people, I think over the last couple of years or so, I was getting a little stir crazy. And my therapist says, why don't you volunteer? <laughs> and so I was like, oh yeah, the food bank. And so I've been volunteering I don't know how long, Wana, year and a half, two years, <laughs> pretty steadily. I pester Wana, I go to all of her work sites. And yeah, it's been a great experience. And I wanted to toss in real quick for your audience that there's no qualifications, right, to come to the food bank. You don't have to qualify to come and get food. If you need food, you just come and get it. Well, and Sam, staying with that, what do you feel has been the biggest impact of the food bank, first on your own experience, but then you're there volunteering, seeing community members come in? What do you feel has been a big impact? Well, for myself, certainly the food has helped me. I'm also on a fixed income. 
I'm a 100% disabled veteran, so it's been really helpful for me to have the food. Like a lot of the things that have been said so far, sometimes I jump in, I, I need it for a week or two. Sometimes I don't need it for a month or two, but it's always really great to have it. It's been even more rewarding for me to volunteer. I mean, I told someone the other day that feeds me in a way that that the food never will. I get social interaction. I get structure. I get to see community members. I've become friends. Several of my uh, volunteer colleagues and I have become friends with all of the people who come through with dogs. We love all the dogs and all the babies. So we definitely uh, pay attention to them and always want to say hello. But I know the food bank impacts our entire community in a very positive way. George, if I could just step in, you can fix this in the mix, but I just wanted to comment before I forget uh, about volunteerism. And uh, Sam, of course, thank you very much for all your contributions. Sort of the way I hold volunteers, you know, Sam is joined by 9,999 other volunteers. It's an amazing experience. The Revit Empire Food Bank is 85 staff and 10,000 volunteers. So without volunteers, nothing happens. And when I think about volunteerism, it it is remarkable. I've spoken at a few memorials of friends, and there's something about a memorial where everybody just wants a little bit more time with the person who has passed away. It's time. And the fact that volunteers give away what ultimately becomes their most precious commodity is the one thing that all of us have in common. All of us is a limited amount of time. And yet they give it away freely to people who they may never meet is remarkable and admirable and just greatly appreciated by everybody. And they do it without requesting anything in return other than the selfish joy that they experience. It's lovely. It's a lovely experience. It is selfish joy for sure. Can I add a little bit about the volunteers? So every, I have many distributions. Mostly sometimes I have two do on the same day. And I see volunteers as not the same group in each distribution, but every morning when or every distribution, I share with the volunteers a little story or they share with me. But have those volunteers is great. Every single these volunteers, they have been a lot. And I told them, if you guys not going to be here, nothing's happened. But with you guys, we can do it a lot. And because they come a new volunteer, and they get it in the same group. There's like a family, like they get in like all together and they get in like relationship. So they come in ready to work. It is no problem with anyone. It's just like we always need volunteers. And I so approach all the volunteers. You know, Sam made a comment about becoming friends with people. That's the second time in as many weeks that I've heard volunteers say, oh no, we now socialize. I have about eight people that, I either sit with for coffee with or we do go to a movie or whatever it is. And I actually never knew that was happening until very recently that there was actually a social scene outside where they met at the food bank and yet continue outside the food bank. It's lovely. And staying with the whole idea of volunteerism, Juana and Allison, could you share with the audience, how can they get engaged? Volunteer wise, do you need mentors or services folks can also provide? So Juana is notoriously very savvy at recruitment and retainment. So I will let her speak to how it actually functions at site distributions, but I'll start a little more globally in that people can really volunteer per their comfort level. So we have heard from people that say, oh, I would love to volunteer, but I can't stand for that long. We've still got a job for you. So we do have activities at the food bank where people can be seated and they're basically tethering off the bags that produce gets put into. So they might not feel comfortable, you know, bending and lifting and twisting or being out at site distributions. However, we can still maximize their time and keep them busy and provide that social gathering of others that want to sit down and stay busy. And then we have youth groups that come in. We have organizations that can come in. So you can be a private business that say, this is a really cool opportunity for team building. And we're all going to come in together and do um, a box build. And we're going to put together a senior basket box. And then we also just have individuals that say, this is incredible. I like the social aspect of it. And I want to go to a site distribution versus, no, I kind of like 
the calm and predictable environment of coming to the warehouse and bagging produce for you know a couple of hours. So really, we can keep people busy in all sorts of ways. So we encourage them to go to our website. It's probably the fastest way to gather as much information as possible, how that meets their schedule. And they can actually register through that link and sign up for the volunteerships that they're interested in. So they can choose the warehouse or site distributions or both. And it has the schedule, the location, just general instructions, especially out at sites for just general safety of keeping your toes protected and wear your sunscreen and layers and all those fun things. And and then they can come and join us. And we, of course, encourage them to stay and come back again. And I will punt it to Juana because she's the queen of that. (laughs) The, in the beginning, the uh, COVID, and, and when we are struggling for volunteers, because the uh, volunteers sometimes we are human and we're afraid to be contact uh, with people when they have any situations. But what I told you have to protect yourself and do whatever you need to do. So in the beginning, I asked my team because I have a short groups. I say, bring a friend to work. The follow-up distributions, they came, oh, I bring my, my buddy, I bring my friend. I say, I want to change it. I, I don't want to say, bring your friend to work. Bring whoever you know to, they can come to work. <laughs> because sometimes you're looking for it. And because one of the volunteers say, I don't have friends. I say, it's okay. You don't need to have friends to come to work. Bring your buddy. If you bring your buddy and you be making them work, bring it over. And seems like they come in, when they come in the first time, they come in like so shy, but I make it like welcome to the team. So when I see a new volunteers, I always say, yay, we have a new volunteer. So everybody like welcome and everybody had their volunteers. So we are having volunteers to our work and to a mission. So I don't see much problem because it seems like everybody loves to be working. And even sometimes we have a like, amount of volunteers we needed for each side and they say oh it's full can I come in over I say yeah come in over I'm always have job for you even if I have a like a couple like Sam for example he ha- he is have surgery and he has a couple weeks of surgery and he sent me a, a message can I come in I said welcome I have a job for you you can hold the traffic you can like we always have something for volunteers and Sam, coming to you as a volunteer, could you share with the audience perhaps one of your favorite stories? Oh, well, I don't have as many uh, good ones as Juana does, but I-, I think the good stories have just been the numerous people who will come in and thank us. And, you know, we want to accept that thankfulness, that gratification, but really it is, you know, like Juana says, we can't do the food bank without volunteers. Well, we can't be volunteers without the food bank. So we try to make sure that they, you know, it's coming to us as an individual volunteer, but it's like a big thing for me to carry, you know, like you're welcome. You're more than welcome. I'm happy to be here. That, and uh, I've already mentioned it, but the dogs and the babies, we like those. (laughs) And David, coming to you besides volunteering, how can folks who are listening to this participate in the food bank? Obviously, you know, donations, perhaps sharing with the audience a little bit about your mix, because I, I think from some people's perspective, food banks are somehow underwritten by the government or big philanthropy. But tell us about the mix of funders and how can folks support? Well, the expression that we like to use around here is that we are interested in receiving a complete serving. And what that involves is financial support. And each one of these has a different purpose. So there's financial support, there's volunteerism, there is food donations, and there's public policy advocacy. And each one plays a different role. The food, you know, we're the Redwood Empire Food Bank. Without food, we're irrelevant. We need food. So food donations from individuals, households, food drives, corporations, all of it is all good. And we need that. We need volunteerism because, as we already indicated through Sam's generous gift of time, 10,000 people contributing their time, nothing would happen without them. Just It's an imperative. It's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. And I really loved what Sam said about, you know, they want to volunteer and want to feel good. And it feels good to be at the Redwood Empire Food Bank. And we can't do our good work without them. So it seems to be working perfectly well. So we have food, we have volunteerism, financial support. You know, you need to pay the dedicated staff. You need to refrigerate the food. You need to fuel the trucks. You know, none of this happens. This year, we'll distribute $59 million worth of groceries. But $59 million worth of groceries doesn't just move about without support. So we need the financial support. And finally, there is public policy. There's advocacy that is 
fantastic as we are, and we are not a woe is us organization. So you're not going to hear anybody in this interview uh, whine about the struggles of what we do. That's just not our culture. That being said, nothing that we do can outmatch the government's ability to impact change. So to the extent that listeners are willing to pick up the phone, write an email to their elected officials to say, make sure that people are well-nourished who are struggling and that other programs that benefit people that are struggling to make ends meet are supported. It's all good. We say here that, you know, why we're here is really simple. People wake up every day, they're hungry, we can help them when we do. However, what we do and how we do it is surprisingly complicated. And so it takes this alchemy of all these buckets that I just mentioned of activity to feed the people and then hunger in our community. Staying with you, David, what do you feel over your double decades of work now at the food bank? What do you feel has been some of the biggest impacts of the food bank on families and the communities at large? Because the Redwood Empire Food Bank, really, I think people listening don't realize your footprint's really large. It's not just, you know, Sonoma County, for example. Right. Well, I think that the biggest change, this is one of my favorite things to say. When I came to Sonoma County, there's an organization, there still is an organization in Petaluma that was a homeless organization. And at the time, I knew that if somebody was willing to be clean and sober, they would have a bed. And I believe that in Petaluma, everybody who was a resident of Petaluma could go to bed comforted by that fact that there was a place to go. But at the time, we were just a ragtag organization, and we couldn't say that about hunger and hunger relief, that we knew people were going to bed hungry. But now, having been in this organization for 21 years, I can honestly tell you that anybody who's hungry can get the help that they need. But that is not a static truth. That is a kinetic truth, that it continues to take additional support, additional volunteers, additional funds, additional food to make sure that people don't go hungry. But what I can tell you is here in February of 2022, anybody who needs food assistance can get the help that they need. That's the biggest change I've seen over the time I've been here. Thank you. And Allison, coming to you, been there in the operations component of it, what do you feel has been the biggest impact of the food bank on the community? I think the fact that we are consistent and reliable is a sense of calm for people. So back to the point where they can bow in and bow out, barring that we have mild schedule changes and holiday changes and things like that, that we hope to over communicate. So nobody would feel like, golly, I have no idea where they are and how to access services. We are consistent and we are stable and we are something that they can rely upon. We take their feedback. So periodically we will do client surveys just to say, tell us how we're doing. So not just from a customer service standpoint, but also from you know food quality and food variety and quantity, because people might say, you know, if it's a senior, for example, that has one to two people in their household, they might say, this is great. And I don't want to sound like I don't appreciate it, but I don't need four pounds of apples. And so it's like, well, that's, that's important to think about. Okay, let's send pre-bagged four pounds of apples at a site that says, great, we have a lot of kids and they'll polish that off by the end of the weekend. So really thinking about the feedback and the people that we serve. And, you know, while we are a large organization, we try to listen to the individuals and listen to the communities that we're serving. So I think our impact is vast and varied, but we also try, you know, to really think about the individuals that we're serving, not just, oh, wow, it's five counties and we do it all the same everywhere. Thank you. Pardon me, George. If I could also just add that I think that something that's part of our culture, you know, in most lines of work, the more you have to do, the worse your day is. You know, if you're fortunate to go home to somebody who's interested in your day, and they say, honey, how was your day? I had to do a lot of work. It was really hard. But here at the Redwood Empire Food Bank, I think to a person, we are excited when we have more to do because more to do means more mission, more execution of what it is that we're trying to do in helping our community. And I think to a person in this organization, they may be hard days, but they're always gratifying days. Well, and staying with that, David, could you share with the audience perhaps one of your favorite stories in the decades that you've worked there? I know that's going to be a hard one or moments. Well, let me just say that I think an expected answer to a question like that is, I've now been doing this long enough where I have this really amazing thing I can say that I've participated in feeding millions of people. 
over the decades. That's pretty sexy. You know, that sounds pretty good. But really, what is the most gratifying story I can tell you is having been part of this organization and being part of somebody who can attract and retain the most dynamic, capable colleagues imaginable. And it gives me goosebumps just to think about it. I am so impressed with everybody I work with. And when you're in the seat that I'm in, I think they see you as the fellow in the corner that's out of touch, maybe. I don't know how they perhaps see me, but they absolutely underestimate the admiration that I have for everybody. And, you know, this is a choice to be here. This is not prison. They can leave anytime they want. And everybody chooses to come back day after day. And like Juana, year after year for 18 years. Are you kidding me? That's crazy. <laughs> That's lovely. And Allison, same question. Do you have a favorite story, favorite moment of your time working there? I have a lot of just favorite moments, but the one that comes to mind, I think because of the work that we do are the accidents. So for example, I was actually at one of Juana's distributions where she doesn't really need my help. I just like to go with her on Saturdays. And so at that particular distribution, a woman drove in and said, oh, is this where I'm supposed to go to get my water kit? So the city of Santa Rosa was offering a program where people could go and pick up sort of a water saving bucket and all the things. And there's a sign on this particular location that the property is owned by the city of Santa Rosa. So it was just a misunderstanding that she thought, oh gosh, this must be the place that I go for this resource. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. We don't have, you know, water buckets. I think you'll have to go over to XYZ location. However, now you're stuck in line. So you can chat with me if you'd like, and I can just usher you through and you can say, no, thank you if you're not interested. However, this is what we're doing. This is why we're here today is with the Revenue Empire Food Bank and we offer food assistance. And she was definitely over the age of 60. And so, you know, you can't presume too much, but she paused and said, oh, so what does somebody need to do to pick up groceries? And I said, oh, it's pretty painless. You get to hang out with me for a minute. We have these cards. We have our W-5 program. We'd register you one time and you can come back to this location as often as you need to. We're here second and fourth Saturday, or we have all these other opportunities for groceries. And she said, well, you know, I'm on a fixed income, but I don't know if I make too much money. And so we reviewed that together and she said, oh, golly, honey, I don't, I don't make nearly that amount. I said, okay, great. So we welcome you to be here. If you'd like to pick up groceries, you're stuck in line anyway. So you might as well. And she paused and said, okay, great. I'll sign up. So I get her all connected. And and she said, gosh, I didn't even know that you all existed. And I don't know exactly what brought me here today, but my husband passed away three years ago. And I've been wondering how I was going to make it on my own without him and a little bit of extra income. And I don't know, like something brought me here today that's beyond me and the universe. And I'm just so grateful. And I said, gosh, this was your way of getting you to drive into the parking lot. So we just kept that sign up that says City of Santa Rosa. And look, we caught you. So it was really just a sweet moment of her being taken aback by, wow, I've needed this for three years and I just never really brought myself to be here. And she went on to say, so how do people find out about you? Because I have neighbors and I have friends that they don't know this exists either. Like they're in the same position I'm in. And I said, well, now you have your charge. So if you're delighted by what you pick up today, if, you know, I didn't scare you off, you can let them know what this looks like, what it feels like, how easy it is. And we even welcome you to volunteer if you have time on your hands. And so she just was like thrilled with the whole opportunity, but it happened completely by accident. She was not coming to seek us. She was looking for a water bucket. Thank you. That was a wonderful story. All right. I'm going to segue to our final question for everybody and start with you, David. And that is out of the two plus years of the pandemic, what do you feel are some of the positive things that have come out of it to support the food bank's work and perhaps people's awareness of food scarcity? I think that uh, there are a couple of things. One, I just will return to empathy. I think that the generation of empathy, you know, we had it before. We had it in the economic downturn in 2008, you know, the Great Recession. There was a bit of that, but there was still some element of sort of the deserving and the undeserving. 
like who exactly was impacted and why and what decisions did they make and did they buy a home and did they have a mortgage they couldn't afford and there was all sorts of stuff going on around that the global pandemic changed all that and it just it was global it was universal you could look everywhere so i think that is i think the greatest silver lining but also i think the pulling back the cover or the pulling back the curtain on food insecurity and hunger that literally within days people were coming for food assistance and that notion that it's not just poor people that there are many people in our world that just live they don't self describe as poor if you were to ask them are they poor no they're not poor they actually have a salary and income they're living just fine they pay their bills everything they've never sought assistance of any type in all their lives but when you turn the spigot off when the money stops it's a game changer for most people and right before the pandemic there was a news story cycling that was the average american doesn't have access to $400 cash it was something like 60% of americans don't have access to $400 cash but that was just like a news story it was just kind of a point of interest well on march 15th with the shelter in place that news story became reality and so suddenly when people were not able to go to work and generate income suddenly they were in need and i think that awareness is the greatest silver lining of all it's just understanding that life is tenuous life is hard and sometimes people need help and it's all okay Thank you. And Juana, coming to you, same question. What do you feel have been some of the good things that have come out of the pandemic? So um, same like David say, but where, where I noticed after this impact with the COVID and with shelter in place and with income, right now, in this moment, with all those fights in the other continent, the community started feeling the fear. So three weeks ago, we moved into one of the distributions at one of the big buildings here in Santa Rosa. Memorial Building. So in the past, when we transfer one distribution to another location, they're always taking time to get stable. But to the third week, we have yesterday served 275 families, and we still have people coming in, but they're growing so fast. And people start sharing, like, they all the prices is went up. So, but the salary is still at the same level. So, and the whole community is impacting. So we're here. And the beginning when I start working in this organization, we don't have that many distributions. My goal always uh, talking to my supervisors, open a new site. We want to end the hunger in Sonoma County, but like they will say, everything changed. So now I see people that come in, or participants come in, and they have a stable income, a stable money that can say, oh, I don't need it. Now you turn around and you see teachers, you see all kind of um, people that have a really good salary probably, but also they have to pay schools, they have to pay feeding the family, pay bills, or something come and they change your life. And uh, you can say to the participant coming through you uh, lines, no, you have a nice car or you have living in house or you this. No, because we're all in the same boat. So we just try to support everybody. So I love to be here every morning when I wake up. Always, even in those 18 years, are you thinking, oh, it's boring. It's every single day is totally different. Even if I go to the distributions with a new, same volunteers, same amount of food same participants, but every single distribution is totally different. So I don't get it like tired. I wake up in the morning and I say, I'm ready for the next adventure. So see what's coming on. So I enjoy my life working at the RSP. Thank you. That was great. And Sam, coming to you, what do you feel are some of the good things that could come out of the pandemic or have come out of the pandemic to help the community? That's a hard one. I spend way too much time watching the news, so I know too well all the horrible things that have happened. But I do think it has given a lot of us a chance to pause and, and really see what's most important. And I know for me, participating with the food bank has been a big change for me. For the community, I would like to think that our community, like David was talking about earlier, does have the empathy 
that they should have for everyone who's struggling. This was a time where a fixed income was not a bad thing. You know, I I didn't suffer with income issues. I, I just hope that our community is realizing that we are all in this and we all need to participate in helping get us through this. So that's where my wishes lie. But I'm not plugged in well enough to know like exactly what good things might have come specifically for like youth and education. Thank you. And Allison, what do you feel are some of the good things coming out of the pandemic to create more awareness and more participation and more support for our food insecure community members? Yeah, because we launched W5 during the pandemic, we had plans to offer a participation program to better understand the people that we were serving anyway. It just happened to be that we went, oh gosh, okay, so we've already put the wheels in motion and now we've got a pesky pandemic that decided to creep in. We did still move ahead with launching that. And so we did outreach for about three to four months, just letting people know why we would be suddenly asking them information about their family, the fact that we would be using technology and, you know, have a tablet in our hands and offered that in paper and through conversations. And we used our social media platform to let people know it was coming. So by the time we launched that in October of 2020, people were saying, oh gosh, finally, I can't wait to get my card or I can't wait to register. We gave people the option to pre-register and fill out paperwork ahead of time or call over the phone. So then it was even less that they were having to do in the moment. And quickly, we were very concerned that it was a club people weren't going to want to be in. So back to the empathy piece, you know, perhaps if there were shame around accessing food assistance or other services. And what we found was actually the opposite. I would go running into David's office and say, like, as it turns out, this is the club people do want to be in because they're saying things like, oh, my sister-in-law told me that I could come and get a card and I could pick up groceries. And we'd say, oh, of course, you could have come before, even before we had this card program, but we're so glad you're here. So I think it gave people a sense of security. Like once I've just shared this once, now I've got this like magical sort of access or path. And back to the point of us being consistent and reliable and there, that not only do they have this card that they don't each time have to share sort of a unique reason as to why they're present, but we're there. So I think that if nothing else, you know, the pandemic of yes, shining a highlight on food assistance and that, you know, the they is now us, but partnered with the fact that we've been here for a lot longer than two years. And so other nonprofits work with us. And when we have 150 partner organizations that access food through us to offer their own programming, and it just strengthens all of our relationships, not just with the people that we serve, but through those partnerships and through individual contributors and organizations and all of that. So I think that, you know, shining a light on the work that we do is exciting because it allows people to get engaged and choose to give their time and money and food and advocacy efforts. But also if you figure in the back of your head, it might not be me today that needs it. But if I know that organization exists, then if my circumstance changes in a few years, I say, you know what? I mean, no different than Sam saying like, wait, all of a sudden when I was recommended to volunteer, he knew the place to go. So it doesn't matter how you first come to us. You can come because you need to pick up groceries or you can come because it's through a work program and then we'll just keep you for 18 years as it's one of the <laughs> Nice. I like it. Great recruitment package. So staying with that, the card, et cetera, I just want you to share with the audience a couple of things. First, the data that you're collecting How are you sharing it? And then second, I think for people listening, the food bank is not requiring folks to show up and say, oh, I'm a citizen, et cetera. So there's no barriers to participate and to secure food. So you're not doing screening for citizenship and all of the rest of that. No. So really the way people, you know, come to sign up is basically providing their unique situation. So how many people are in their family of those, how many are children? And then if they want things like, you know, diapers for us to better understand just a a date of birth. So we'd know are diapers appropriate or are school supplies appropriate. And we also offer programming like summer lunch. And so when kids are out of school for the summer, we provide meal bundles. And so it's really helpful again, to know 
how many children you have and at what age. So then we provide the appropriate amount of food. Beyond that, the information doesn't go anywhere. I mean, we're sort of hardly looking at it ourselves. And that, again, I'm not concerned about a unique household and their activity. It's just so we can say every month, okay, so how many new people are we serving? How many of the same people are we serving? How many are seniors? How many are children? To your point, our daily essentials program is diapers. And so what does that look like? How do do we order more diapers? Are we seeing an increase? So it's not really even about the participant. It's really just how do we perform? I mentioned that we're growing out of our facility. Well, if we can measure our growth over time, we can maybe guesstimate what does that look like for us five years from now, 10 years from now? So it's not so much about each individual family. It's really just about overarching who we're serving and what does that look like? Yeah, how far are they traveling? Has there been growth in a certain region? So are there activities either in one of the neighboring counties or one of the unique cities that we serve if they're impacted by something in particular? So it's really global is what we're looking at. We're not really looking at a finite family situation. We do have people, it doesn't happen often, but We do have people that are really concerned about sharing any personal information. And so we just respectfully say, if you tell me that your name is, you know, John Smith, that I just ask that you're always John Smith. And when I greet you and I say, good morning, John, you don't look at me like, why are you calling me John? Because (laughs) you've opted to tell me that your name is John Smith. And so I just don't want you to be John Smith today. And, you know, Lewis Jones next week, like just be the same alias. And then, and really, again, it's just to understand how many people are we serving and how far are you traveling? So there are ways around that comfort. If somebody says, you know, I'm going through a legal situation and I don't want my name on this or that just in case, we just say, if if you tell me your name's Mary, when I say good morning, Mary, we're on the same page. So that does happen, but not often. Thank you. And and to Wanda's point earlier, I think the W5 program also allows folks to access your distribution points. And I know your distribution points are many. And so perhaps it's a a way to educate, if you will, and inform your participants, your recipients of all of the entry points that they may not have to spend time and gas to get to a point where maybe a point in their own neighborhood, for example. Yeah, so we have on the back of the W-5 card, it has our contact information, which includes our phone number to our Food Connections Resource Center, so they can call and get help if they want to talk to somebody or get help with CalFresh application assistance. And then it also has our website, which includes a Get Food page. So on our main website, which is refb.org, in the top right corner, there's a button that says get food. And from there, somebody could put in, again, per their comfort level, an exact address or a street or a zip code, and it will give them a schedule based upon proximity of all the different distributions and the time. And so if somebody says, you know, I'm not really comfortable calling or it's beyond our work hours or they work a swing shift, they do have access to our website at any time and they can say, okay, great. I see that they have something in the morning and they can, you know, head over because again, the one card works everywhere. So they wouldn't have to re-register or jump through any hoops. They're welcome to go to any of our distributions anytime. Great. Thank you. Can I add a little bit? So also we have like um, neighbors, happy neighbors, So some participants asking to neighbors to collect food for them. So it's another good thing to help the community. Thank you. So I want to thank Allison and David for sharing the Redwood Food Empire programs and services work today. I also want to thank Juana and Sam for sharing their experience with participating in the Redwood Food Bank programs, as well as how the programs have impacted their careers and lives. We'll make sure that listeners have your contact information, the Redwood Empire Food Bank website, and social media so that community members can receive food and engage in the Redwood Empire Food Bank programs and support your work to help our neighbors to secure food and services. Please stay safe and healthy as we all work our way through this pseudo new normalcy. That's it for this hour special show focused on food insecurity and how the Redwood Empire Food Bank is helping to provide both food and support services to our children, families, and seniors in Northern California. You've been listening to the voices of CEO David Goodman, Director of Programs Allison Goodwin, along with Food Bank Services recipient and volunteer Sam Cagle, as well as Program Coordinator Juana Renovato. 
To make a donation, volunteer, and support the work of the Redwood Empire Food Bank, please go to refb.org. And to find out more about food insecurity in San Francisco and the work of the San Francisco Marin Food Bank, please listen back to our interview with the Director of Community Engagement, Katie McKnight, in Episode 2 of our special COVID-19 series. We hope that you enjoyed the insights, points of view, and personal stories from the voices of changemakers and their nonprofits and small businesses featured in this series. To find out more and get engaged with the nonprofits, small businesses, and staff members featured in the series, please go to my website, georgecoster.com, and click on Voices of the Community to find links to the extended versions of these interviews and to listen to the entire series. After listening to these stories, we hope that you will consider making a donation and volunteering to provide a hand up to your fellow community members. Today's episode was made possible by the audio wizard and our associate producer, Eric Estrada, and the graphics magic of Casey Nance from Citron Studios, along with the wonderful crew at the San Francisco Public Press and KSFP. Voices of the Community is supported by a grant from the James Irvine Foundation, dedicated to a California where all low-income workers have the power to advance economically. More at irvine.org. Voices of the Community is a member of Intersection for the Arts, which allows us to offer you a tax deduction for your contributions. Please go to georgecoster.com and click on the donate link to make a donation to help us provide future shows just like this one. While you're on our website, you can enjoy our archived past shows, which feature community voices working on solutions to critical issues facing Northern California communities. And you can sign up for our newsletter to find out more about future shows, as well as shows and events from the organizations that are included in our episodes. Take us along on your next COVID walk by subscribing to Voices of the Community on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, at George Coster, and we'd love to hear from you with feedback and show ideas, so send us an email to george at georgecoster.com. I'm George Coster in San Francisco, and thank you for listening.